Hey everyone, this is Brooks Popwell from Pure Life Ministries. You're about to hear part of our bi-weekly podcast, Purity for Life. Hope you enjoy. Pastor and evangelist Glenn Meldrum, a longtime friend of Pure Life Ministries, talks about why it can be overwhelming for pastors to try to help those dealing with the issue of sexual sin and what they can do to effectively minister in this area. Well, Glenn, I know you've spent your life in the ministry, first as a pastor of many years and now as an evangelist for over 20 years. So I wanted to talk on the issue of pastors who just feel overwhelmed. They find themselves really challenged by the issue of sexual sin in their churches, but they might feel like they're running out of solutions or they're just not seeing this thing go anywhere. From your experience, what makes this topic so overwhelming to pastors? Well, I would really say that there's probably a lot of things that are contributing to it. Part of it is just pastors feeling overwhelmed, period. And so you have pastors that are just overwhelmed, and then you add to this the problem of sexual sins that are in the church. And what's really gone on, and so I've been in the church for a long time. I've been in ministry for going on 40 years. And the decline in the church is kind of like directly following the decline in our culture. And as our culture is growing more immoral, more wicked, uh, that is getting into the church. And then you are having people that are being more damaged coming into the church, and they are bringing the baggage of all the crazy sins that they have practiced. So pastoring just period is getting harder. Um, I'm not using that as an excuse. It's just getting harder. Now you have the problem that these sexual sins are becoming so prevalent that pastors just really don't know what to do with it. At one time, the subject of divorce was hardly spoken about, not because it wasn't an issue, but because there were so few people in it. So pastors didn't have to make it a huge thing, but they would talk about it. But now it's so prevalent, how can a pastor talk about it and not lose half their their congregation? So part of it is the issue has become so huge that it becomes difficult for pastors to deal with it. And then you have the aspect of pastors that are now starting to look not the same way at sin as what they used to. So you now have this humongous problem in the church of fornication. And fornication is premarital sex in any way, shape, or form. So it can be pornography. It can be the one-night stand. It can be a man and woman living together outside of matrimony. But because of the compromise that has come into the church, now pastors just kind of overlook it. And, you know, I even know pastors that have people in fornication on their worship teams. And, I mean, it's just in places of leadership in the church. And it's just they don't see God as holy anymore. And because they don't see God as holy anymore, they don't see sin as exceedingly sinful. And it's just getting very overwhelming to them. So now the next step is going to be with homosexuality. More and more churches are trying to uh, somehow justify it. And it's step after step that it gets worse and worse because this decline in sin is only going to get faster, like a snowball being put down a big hill as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then how in the world are you going to stop it? I think something that must be part of why this topic is so overwhelming is there are actually kind of like barriers that work against pastors in this area. And I want to talk to you about maybe the first one, I think, and that is the wrong approach that is kind of the standard approach to this issue in many churches. So can you describe what that wrong approach looks like oftentimes? Well, I could probably bring it out uh, in a couple of ways. One of it is a humongous problem that we have in the church of the thoughts of professionals. So a lot of pastors don't want to counsel things that are too difficult because they don't feel qualified. And by not feeling qualified, they say that, well, that has to be done in a prof- with a professional because these problems are getting too complex and I can't handle them. And that's just not true. Uh, the problems of man, the sinfulness of man has been there. It's Man is not more sinful today than what he's been in the past. And so it used to be 100 and 500 and 1,000 and You know, when Jesus walked this earth, there was always the answers that were there. It's not that they're not there. It's that we have believed lies that these are for professionals. The other aspect of it is, and this is a terrible thing. I mean, it's terrible. It's And it's so deep-rooted in the church 
that I don't see how it's going to be dealt with other than some churches beginning to understand and change, but it's the bringing in of the secular psychology into Christianity. And the problem is, if people just do a little bit of research, they will understand, they will see the fact that all secular psychology came out of atheism and came out of humanism. It's just plain and simple. It doesn't take a lot of research to understand that. It is not based upon the Word of God. And what happens then is they try to mingle Christianity and this atheistic belief system. And it doesn't work. It's powerless because it's not calling people to repentance and the transformation of their life. So I think a combination of their of those two are seeing are, are bringing pastors to the place where they're seeing seeing themselves as failures. They can't do it. So they counsel somebody in sexual sin and they never see him overcome. They counsel, you know, people with their marital problems and they see the marriage still end up in divorce. And because they've incorporated the world into their concept of counseling or they don't think themselves capable, so they send them to the world to do what should actually be done through the church. Yeah, so what would you say to bolster pastors' faith in that way? Because, like you said, we are experiencing this avalanche of problems. They aren't new problems, but there's just such a concentration of all these different problems. And then, yeah, for whatever reason, you know, the inroads of psychology or whatever, we don't have a lot of pastors out there maybe with a track record of seeing success. And so it can be intimidating to to start down that path with someone. How would you bolster their faith uh, in that way? Well, I would say that this is really kind of a discipleship issue. And a man, a woman can go to Bible school and doesn't mean they've ever been discipled. So they have been given knowledge from a, a college standpoint or seminary standpoint. And so really, this is more of a discipleship issue. And what I mean by that is if we've been taught wrong, we've got to be taught right. And so if we have believed wrong in counseling people, then we have to begin to believe right. And part of it, we've got to go back to the Word and see everything we need for life and godliness has been given to us. It is supplied in the Word. We don't need to go outside of it. The Word of God is enough. But then at the very core of true biblical counseling is repentance. And if we have removed repentance from the message of the church, we've removed the very means of helping people to overcome their sins. That's destroying marriages or whatever expression it may be. So it's coming back to the Word of God. It's coming back to the place of understanding the Word is sufficient and that there, that the Holy Spirit as well is able to work in the midst of that. Now, I do believe that pastors need to help educate themselves but they need to do it through learning what biblical counseling is, not secular counseling, not this integrated, worldly, secular concept with with the Bible, which is just a failed attempt, but going to the Word of God and true biblical counseling and starting to learn some of the ways of how this works, because it does work. It is powerful. It does bring deliverance. Those who want to be set free, the Word of God is able to do it. The answers are right there. They've been given to us, and the Lord has held nothing back. Well, for pastors who are on board with that approach, and they would have a willingness to take a stand in that way, what are some other barriers that might crop up and keep a pastor, or to at least discourage a pastor, from dealing with the sexual sin issue directly? Well, there again, I guess I'd kind of go back to the very opening statements I made, but a lot of it is going to be pastors are just wore out. And, you know, I hate to say that. I, you know, I'm across this country with all kinds of pastors. And one of the things that can wear pastors out more than anything is counseling issues. And what wears them out is not the counseling issues themselves, but counseling people that don't want help. That is, that, that is exhausting, absolutely exhausting. And so then you have the problem of pastors that are having just contentious people in the church and not wanting to uh, really walk the walk. And so you start adding these things up. And a pastor gets really tired. And when they are really getting exhausted, uh, they just don't want to take on another thing. And they become so exhausted that I would even say that they're not willing to go deeper into study. They're not trying to learn what is biblical counseling compared to secular psychology. You know, so they won't even sometimes go there because they're just, they're just trying to keep their head above water. And if you're feeling like you're trying to keep your head above water, then you, you don't want to take anything else that you think might be 
uh, weighing you down more to put you under. And so I feel for pastors. It is hard pastoring. It is hard pastoring. But yet, we still need to, as pastors, to be pressing in to learn how to do what we've been called to do better. Well, you touched on what I think would have to be the biggest barrier, and that would be certain kinds of counselees. And, um, you know, we've all been there, I guess, where we've struggled with wanting to change ourselves. But given the fact that pastors do face that issue of resistance from some people who really need help, what is your advice to them about dealing with that? The issue is going to be is, and, and I really say this a lot to pastors, is that we have to feed the hungry. Those who aren't hungry, there's nothing you can do about it. Those in the church that don't want to change, you just you just can't. You, there's nothing you can do. You can only deal with those who have a hunger. That's why when you look at Jesus, he did ministry in a way that so often it's not done. And he dealt one way with the multitude, where the multitude would be the mass, uh, the people that weren't saved. They were the, the ones that were following uh, out of the excitement and everything else. But those who became his disciples then and left, in essence, the multitude, became part of his disciples. So then he started ministering to them as those that were followers and that had a knowledge of God. But then out of the out of the disciples, he had the 12, and he took the 12 to him, and he poured more into the 12 than what he did into the disciples. And then out of the 12, you have the three, and that's where Jesus poured most of his time in. And the reason why I went through that is basically because you have to be able to see those who really want help. If people don't want help, you could sit down for 100 hours and at the end of it just be totally exhausted because they don't want help. And so as a pastor, they have to be willing to counsel those that want help. And those who don't, they have to be willing to walk away and commit them in God's hands and say, God, when they're ready, bring them back around. Help me to administer to them then. And so that's a hard thing. Uh, It is a very hard thing. You know, with Pure Life Ministries, they are wanting people to come in that are finally at the place of enough hunger that they're wanting deliverance. Because if they come here and they have no hunger, they're not going to make it because they're not going to overcome. So that overcoming is really tied into that place of wanting victory, and pastors have to pour into those that want it. What tools does a pastor maybe already have to help him start dealing with this issue that you'd say he shouldn't overlook? There is more healing in repentance than people understand. There's tremendous healing in it because the root of our pain is in the sin that we've committed or that has been committed against us. God's not asking us to go back and dredge up all the past and all the things that secular psychologists so often want want us to do. We are to deal with the reality of our sin and the sin of the past. Yes, we repent of that. But in Christ, we're a new creature. We have a new beginning. So we are to then begin to put off the works of the flesh, and to put on the the new life in Christ. And so that is one of the really big things that pastors have to do. They have to speak of repentance. They have to speak of putting off the old nature, putting on the new nature. And, you know, with some of that, there is the truth that will come to people that is going to really be defining of whether or not they want the answer or not. Um, if people just want to blame, there's nothing you can do for them. I mean, I remember times of having a couple sit before me that's having marital problems, and if they want to do the blame game and just point fingers at each other, it's a waste of my time. I can't do anything for them. But I've seen couples come and sit before me that were willing to take the path of repentance, and when they took the path of repentance, there was healing. And so it's, you know, it's, it's right there. It's more readily available than we understand. I think maybe we've complicated this so much because we've looked at sin as all these various different kind of issues rather than understanding it's sin, and there's one remedy to sin, and that's repentance and the blood of Christ. I know you also do speak on our speaking team here at Pure Life, and so I wanted to touch on the idea of a church doing something direct associated with this issue, Um, not necessarily even just our ministry, but just the idea that a church would want to take a targeted approach to raise this issue in their church, what immediate results would you think they could expect out of that? Well, I guess the response of the pastor needs to be a response whether or not there's immediate results or not. They need to do it. And the reason why they need to do it, the last statistics I just recently heard was that 65% of men in the church 
are in pornography to one extent or another. So the problem is epidemic. Now, you can deny it. You can say it's not going on. You can, you know, dance around it, bring some superficial type of thing or have a cutesy men's meeting where guys get together and have breakfast and do virtually nothing. I mean, there's all these other things that most of them are just worthless. Or you can say, we need to really deal with this. It's not going to disappear if you're silent. Down the road, what can the church be like as they start to walk down this path and and get these issues out of the way? Well, I think always a church should have one dimension of it as being an emergency ward. And so it should be a place that it's all the time there for those who are in crisis coming and to find healing and the power that's there. But if we do it right, what's happening is people come into the emergency ward, they are being dealt with, and they are finding healing, and then they're finding stability. And the more people that are in a church that are walking faithful to the Lord, each of those individuals are going to be bearers of the presence of God, bringing the presence of God more into the church. Sin grieves the Holy Spirit. I mean, that's what Paul told us. He told us, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And so sin grieves. And that's just the reality of it. You start dealing with sin. You start seeing people walking in this loving obedience, this holiness that is a, is, is a joy to the heart of God. And you start seeing God come more amongst his people. You start seeing marriages start slowly get healthy because it's not just the healing of those who are in these sins, but it's keeping those from it. It's the aspect of properly teaching people before they get married to walk in purity and not to do damage, violence to themselves by being in sexual sin before the marriage, that they begin to do it God's way. And when they do it God's way, the more it's done, the more it brings a blessing to the church, life to the church. And that power is there then to become, if I might say it like this, a better emergency ward. Because then you can begin to see greater power there to bring in more people that are hurting And you see greater deliverance. So the testimony of the church becomes greater because you're seeing greater results of people being changed. We're not out. The church should never be out to to just try and get numbers. Because when we do that, we miss the whole aspect of the gospel. It's about transformation. And sometimes that can be slow. But it's better to do it right than to try and and build this, this facade of a church with hundreds, thousands of people and it's on this, on this crumbling foundation because it was not built upon Christ and the soundness of his word. And so he wants us to do it his way because his way works. Thanks for listening. You can find Purity for Life on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Or just go to our website, purelifeministries.org slash podcast. Mm-hmm.